Hello, welcome to the California Telehealth Policy Coalition webinar, Telehealth and Medi-Cal, What's New for 2022? My name is Mei Kwong. I'm the Executive Director at the Center for Connected Health Policy. CCHP is the convener for the California Telehealth Policy Coalition. A little bit of background on the coalition. It is made up of almost 200 different state and national organizations interested in telehealth policy in the state of California. We meet monthly each month to discuss recent events and policy in uh, the state of California. If you are interested in joining the coalition, please feel free to reach out to CCHP staff and we'll be able to get you connected for that. We also have a page on the CCHP website with more information on the coalition. We'd like to thank today's sponsors, AARP California, the California Healthcare Foundation, and the Center for Connected Health Policy for their support in making this webinar possible. A few housekeeping things before we get started. First, the purpose and key objectives of today's webinar. We are going to provide an overview of the recent DHCS proposals on telehealth policies for Medi-Cal. We're going to hear from different stakeholders and their perspectives and impacts on these proposals if they should go through intact as they have been proposed. They'll then be followed by a panel discussion and then um, answering questions from the audience regarding the presentations or on the proposals. Please note that we are taking questions in the Q&A section. So if you have a question for our panelists, please type it into Q&A. Chat should only be used for technical questions if you have issues with Zoom or so, something like that. Today's webinar is also being recorded. So the recording will be up later on the CCHP website. So you'll be able to review that. Or if you have a colleague who wasn't able to make today's webinar, they'll be able to access it that way. We're going to hear first from Amy Durbin, our policy advisor at CCHP, who will provide an overview on the proposals. Then we will have a panelist discussion moderated by Peggy Wheeler from the California Hospital Association. And we're very fortunate to have our panelists, Joe Garanzos from AARP California, Katie Heidnorn from Insure the Uninsured Project, Dr. Anthony Magic from Radies Children's Hospital, and Lisa Masabura from Planned Parenthood Affiliates of California. So I will now turn it over to Amy. Thank you, May. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna kick us off with our overview um, and then just wanted to do a quick recap of where things ended last year in regard to California Medi-Cal policy before getting into the current proposal. So um, AB 133 was the budget trailer bill from last year that extended the COVID-19 emergency flexibilities related to telehealth until the end of 2022. The bill also required DHCS to convene an advisory group, which many coalition members were a part of, that met three times over last fall. A report was released in December last year as well, summarizing that process and discussion and DHCS proposed approaches. Overall, the goal of the work group process was to help inform DHCS's budget proposal for this year, which is what we'll be going over today, and areas where conversations continue to be focused. So, we can go on to the next slide and the, the work group process was somewhat limited in its focus going into the process because DHCS had committed to a variety of policies, including continuing payment parity and coverage for all telehealth modalities, including audio only and including FQHCs and RHCs. While payment parity for asynchronous has also been mentioned as part of the proposal, consistent with pre and during COVID policies, the budget trailer bill language that came out with this most recent proposal does not explicitly say that or ensure that. Um, also remaining unclear is potential exceptions to DHCS's proposed limitation on only allowing provider and patient relationships to be established via synchronous live video telehealth. So as you can see, you know, for instance, there are some exceptions articulated in certain certain circumstances for FQHCs and RHCs related to asynchronous, but those are limited and the proposal suggests it's possible more exceptions can and will be considered. So that'll likely remain uh, one ongoing area of discussion, given stakeholder concerns with the limitations included at this point that were also raised throughout the advisory group process. If we go to the next slide. Um, a few more areas within the proposal focus um, included policies related to patient consent. So while existing law already requires consent related to telehealth, the newly proposed Medi-Cal policy seek to expand that requirement 
to also require that the process include various information. So including the patient's right to in-person services and options related to in-person services, as well as any potential limitations or risks related to receiving services via telehealth. DHCS is also proposing continued consideration around third-party corporate telehealth providers, potentially consistent with laws passed last year in that regard relevant to private payers, which included some provisions actually listed as part of that previous proposal related to consent. Um, so there's been some confusion and blurring around the issues of patient consent and patient choice and education as well. Um, and then the proposal also speaks to DHCS continuing to look at ways to monitor telehealth utilization, which has been one of their main focuses as well. Um, and then we get into a, a few new phased in requirements, essentially requiring the use of video and in-person services. So that by 2024, providers delivering services via audio only will also be required to provide the option of video services. And by 2024, providers offering telehealth services will also have to offer in-person services or be obligated to facilitate a referral to in-person care. Then there's a specific policy proposed that would limit the ability of health plans to use telehealth to just synchronous telehealth when looking to utilize telehealth to meet network adequacy requirements. And then Lastly, the proposal speaks to a telehealth research and evaluation plan that will be developed and further discussed with the goal of better understanding impacts across populations and impacts related to access and quality as well. And then with that, I think that concludes the overview. So I'll go ahead and, and pass things over to our, our moderator of today's panel on the proposal, Peggy Wheeler, who is the Vice President of Policy at the California Hospital Association and responsible for developing, advocating, and executing policies, legislation, and regulations on behalf of member hospitals at the state and national levels. Peggy? Thank you so much, Amy, and let me offer my um, good morning to all that are in attendance today. We are um, uh, going to have a great panel uh, presentations and then a good, robust discussion. So um, as May said, uh, if you have questions, please uh, put them in the chat and um, I will call upon those questions after our presenters finished. Um, the California Hospital Association fully supports and is actively engaged in coalition-based activities but at the state and federal level to modernize telehealth policies so that we can increase um, access to care and reduce the overall cost of care. Uh, we're happy to, to be in coalition with many of you on, on this call and um, we'll continue to uh, support and advocate um, here in the state of California for those policies that will ensure that patients who have come to rely on the telehealth services can continue to access them. Um, it's been used many times um, in many conversations that COVID really um, exposed the disparities in the unequal access and telehealth really was able to, to fill that gap and we need to keep that going. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to the presentations from our panelists today. We're going to start with uh, Joe Garbanzos, who is the state president, a volunteer position at the AARP California. He works with policymakers, volunteers, and staff in achieving AARP's strategic priorities in California. His body of work includes CEO, executive director at Samahan Health Centers, an FQHC in San Diego. He consults in healthcare outreach and education on coordinated Medicare and Medicaid programs to, um, for the hard to reach and culturally diverse communities. So Joe, I'll turn it over to you first. Thank you, Peggy, and good morning to you all. Thank you to uh, May, Amy, and staff for organizing this panel. And thank you for uh, all of you who join us this morning. Um, I am Joe Garbanzos, as introduced by Peggy. I'm the state president of AARP California. 
We are a volunteer driven organization representing about 3 million members in the state of California. We are nonpartisan and nonprofit. We have a social agenda at AARP that includes advocating and offering support through information and resources to seniors. And that is 50 plus years old um, and their families to choose to age well, gracefully, and to have access uh, in good health and wellness programs in livable communities of their choosing. So effective telehealth policies and practices are important to our members and their families. We at AARP have a history of working in this space long before the pandemic. We collaborated with the uh, California Telehealth Coalition uh, in advocating in favor of significant telehealth policy improvements since the start of the pandemic. Specifically, in 2020, ARP and the California Telehealth, Telehealth Coalition asked the legislature in Sacramento, the budget committees, to expand FQHC, rural health centers, and tribal clinics and in communities uh, to get better payments, specifically in areas of store and forward and e-consult practices. Is that uh, oh, before the pandemic, the reimbursement uh, was not uh, uh, commensurate. So AARP in collaboration with the California Telehealth Coalition pushed for this. And we're delighted to report that uh, that is now a reality. So we recognize that FQHCs and rural health centers and tribal clinics play an important role in terms of delivering care to uh, our communities. So it's good to see that they're getting uh, a hearing and support in terms of getting access to better reimbursements. The panel discussion today is timely opportunity for us to share our perspective at ARP and provide comments to uh, the uh, Department of Healthcare Services proposals to improve telehealth. And I'm looking forward to the conversation with uh, our participants and our panelists, and thanks for the opportunity. And thank you, Joe, uh, appreciate the presentation. Next, um, let's go to Katie Heidorn uh, for our next uh, presentation. Katie is the executive director of the Insure the Uninsured project, ITUP. Prior to leading ITUP, Katie worked as the government affairs advocate for HealthNet and was development director and policy lead at the nonprofit California Coverage and Health Initiatives. Previously, Katie served for five years in the Brown Administration at the California Health and Human Services Agency as the Assistant Secretary of Program and Fiscal Affairs and Health Reform, and as a Governor's appointee in a Senate-confirmed position, Deputy Secretary of Special Programs. Katie, we look forward to your comments today from the ITUP perspective. Hi, Peggy. Thanks so much uh, for that great introduction and a huge thanks to May, Amy, and the team for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation with these wonderful panelists and, um, and all of the questions from the audience. Um, Insure the Uninsured Project, or ITEP as we call it, is a uh, over 25-year-old health policy organization. Um, and over the years, we've shifted from uh, just focusing on uh, getting people into coverage to also making sure that that coverage is meaningful. Um, we convene the largest health policy conference focused on the safety net in California every year. Uh, we just had our 26th annual conference, uh, which was our pleasure to host. Uh, we do working groups across the state in different regions. Um, so there's something there for everyone from the, the local health delivery system. Uh, and we also produce educational fact sheets and policy forums. And we have a policy forum tomorrow uh, on the culture of coverage. So uh, we are here as a resource um, and we are very happy to be in the telehealth conversation. Um, I was proud to serve um, along with several of my colleagues here on the DHCS um, telehealth advisory work group. Uh, it was a great experience and very excited to see where they're going with the policy. 
Um, you know, I think from our perspective, uh, you know, we're in telehealth because when we did our regional listening groups during COVID, everyone said telehealth is incredibly transformational. Um, we need connectivity, we need devices, and virtual care is the future. So I'm really excited to be here to think um, about how we can make sure that this policy ensures that there's that baseline payment for telehealth services so that we have the opportunity to truly iterate um, and expand on virtual care offers, offerings to make sure that it's a tool, not the whole, not the whole uh, care picture, but a tool to really enhance care where hopefully we get better care, better outcomes, um, and more comp, uh, culturally competent care. So very excited to be here and thank you for the opportunity. And thank you, Katie, appreciate you being here. I'll introduce our next uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Anthony Madgett. Dr. Majid is currently the Associate Chief Medical Officer for Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego and a clinical professor of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at the University of California, San Diego, where he's been a member of the faculty since 1992. Dr. Majid serves as the physician lead for the Rady Telehealth Program and has been the chair of the California Telehealth Policy Education Committee. Dr. Madgett's research interests include racial and ethnic disparities in human subjects, research, and telehealth. And we're so happy to have you this morning. Please go ahead. I, I want to thank May and Amy for this opportunity, as long as being part of a terrific panel. I sort of have a different perspective than Joe, even though I, I definitely qualified for membership at AARP for several years now that in addition to being at UC San Diego and Rady, I'm also the past president of the Children's Specialty Care Coalition, which is an advocacy group that represents over two thirds of the pediatric specialists in the state. So really can speak to the benefits of telehealth in providing care to our pediatric population within California. Some of the things that we've seen are not only improving access, but not in situations improvement in the type of care that we can deliver. And recently the coalition in combination with RAND Corporation actually did an assessment of how pediatric specialty services were delivered through the pandemic and continuing that to where we are now, still in the pandemic, but sort of to a baseline or some type of equilibrium. So we have some very interesting information to really demonstrate that telehealth clearly has a 15 to 20% percentage of stable care for providing pediatric specialty care where this really does fit in so well with the proposal for DHCS and going forward for reimbursement and coverage for services is that we find in pediatric specialty care, there are entire regions of the state and the country for that matter who don't have access to pediatric specialists. So very interested in having this conversation when you talk about network adequacy or the alternative for in-person care, oftentimes for specialty care, there is no in-person alternative. And I think we'll have a nice discussion about this in terms of consent education for the parents and that the alternative to give in-person visits may actually be no care at all, given the great distances that people have to travel. And in closing remarks, and as far as an introductory statement, we actually have found some situations where telehealth really is an improvement. Uh, two specific areas are mental health, as well as gender affirming care. We found that the ability to provide mental health services for children, adolescents, young adults is beyond the in-person capability because of the comfort that they can have in a private situation and better access to care. And the other, we have a very nice and uh, widespread gender affirming program at Rady in similar situations across the state. And oftentimes these patients are actually much more comfortable being in the privacy of their home if they have a place to be private to really interact with their practitioners. So again, really thank you for the privilege of being part of this webinar and looking forward to the discussion. And thank you so much, Dr. Majid. And our final panelist uh, before we um, engage in some dialogue and questions is Lisa Matsubara. Uh, Ms. Matsubara is the General Counsel and VP of Policy at Planned Parenthood Affiliates of California where she works on issues related to access to comprehensive sexual and reproductive health care, as well as health care issues related to patient privacy, Medi-Cal, and telehealth. She's been part of the California Telehealth Policy Coalition and has worked on state legislation related to telehealth, and is currently one of the co-chairs of our legislative committee. Lisa, I'll turn it over to you. 
Thanks, Peggy. Um, and thank you to Amy and Robbie and um, for having me on this panel with my colleagues that I love working with in the telehealth space. Um, so I'm Lisa, I am the General Counsel and VP of Policy for Planned Parenthood Affiliates of California. We are the statewide advocacy group and we actually represent the seven separately incorporated uh, affiliates in uh, Planned Parenthood affiliates throughout the state of California. Together, they operate over 100 health centers, community health centers across the state, um, serving over a million patients a year. Um, and um, I think you know, what's been really great about working in this telehealth space is really how telehealth can really expand access to some of the patient populations that our health centers serve. Um, uh, our health centers predominantly serve of uh, people of color, as well as 90, over 90% 90 of the patients that the Planned Parenthood Health Centers see uh, rely on either some sort of public program such as Medi-Cal or a limited scope Medi-Cal program such as Family Pact, uh, or they're uninsured and rely on, on some form of charity care. And so um, policies uh, regarding reimbursement in the Medi-Cal space really has a huge impact on um, our health center operations and the ability for us to provide uh, patients with care. Um, I think, you know, just some background, uh, Planned Parenthood has been a sponsor, was a co-sponsor on AB 32, which was a piece of legislation that went through, um, that's actually still pending, it's a two-year bill, which really sought to maintain some of the flexibilities that were allowed um, under the COVID pandemic in telehealth space, particularly with regard to payment parity uh, for uh, certain services, for all services actually. And then, um, and uh, as a result of that, we were heavily engaged in the budget process last year um, I also, along with Katie um, and Joe, we sat on the Telehealth Advisory Stakeholder Committee um, uh, and were able to sort of make sure that we were able to provide our perspective to the department. Um, I think in terms of what we really look for is, um, in terms of telehealth is really pushing um, the ability to really increase um, equity and healthcare, uh, we really seek to make sure that the care that we provide is patient-centered. And throughout the pandemic, it has been really clear to us that you know, many of our patients prefer uh, to have some of their uh, services be provided via telehealth. Um, and you know, as Dr. Majid just said, uh, our health centers do provide some gender-affirming care that has been a service that many of our patients really prefer to have uh, via telehealth. Um, it's also been, you know, we even prior to the pandemic, we did do a significant amount of uh, contraceptive co counseling through the use of both synchronous and asynchronous telehealth. Um, and so uh, just being able to have some of the flexibilities and having Medi-Cal actually reimburse those services has really increased our ability to provide many of our services that are appropriate uh, through telehealth. So, um, you know, I think as we go into this post-pandemic world, hopefully uh, soon, uh, we really seek to make sure that we don't put up some of the barriers that had prevented a lot of the Medi-Cal providers from actually providing these services in the past um, and that we move forward. I know Katie and I have talked about it just with a, a new lens that we're not just going back, but we're really looking towards the future in terms of making sure that um, folks have as much access to healthcare as, as they can in whatever modality that um, is appropriate and that they prefer. So looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you again to all the panel members. And as May has put um, uh, in the chat, if you do have questions for our panelists, please go ahead and put them in the question and answer. But I'm swimming in questions. So <laughs> um, let me start by um, talking about the process that we go through here in the state of California in terms of the budget process and the and the policy process before we were um, 
on with our audience, uh, May and I were reflecting on just how long we've been having this conversation about telehealth flexibilities. And if you're not of a strong constitution, you could get weary about how many times you have to have this conversation. But it seems we're at an inflection point. I talk about the silver lining of COVID and one of the silver linings of what was a terrible time for all of us in terms of the isolation and other things. Telehealth did what we have been saying for years, it was there to do. It was a tool that allowed for access to care for not only those who are, have been traditionally underserved and unserved, but now for people that are used to being served and didn't have a way to be served. Are you feeling from um, your interactions in this process that there is an inflection point, that this is an appropriate time and an opportunity? Joe, I'll start with you. Thank you, Peggy. I found my unmute button. Uh, so terrific uh, question. You know, from a personal perspective, I don't, I don't have to go very far when it comes to getting uh, stories about the utility of telehealth. You know, in the past year, I have not seen my doctor in person, period. I, my engagement with my doctor is by phone. And so that's telehealth, right? Uh, and so I think my experience can be replicated so many times. So I think the telehealth practice, if you will, before the pandemic was like nice to do, an exception perhaps. Now it's probably moving to the mainstream, to your point. So the inflection point is there. I think the, the challenge is, especially with the Department of Healthcare Services talking about the population we're talking about here, Medi-Cal, is there is a, an urge perhaps to now focus on utilization and control as opposed to making it easier. I can understand that there's some you know, hesitation and fear that it will be um, overutilized and uh, you know, it might be prone to abuse. But I think we have to be careful when it comes to uh, unintended consequences. As we, as we try to learn from the experience, there are some good outcomes, good data to support, but to react to the uh, need to control utilization might be um, an unintended action that will create uh, bad outcomes. So that will be my perspective to your question. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, and uh, I appreciate that perspective. Lisa, I, I wanna turn to you, um, especially for the, the patients that you would represent, um, engagement in this process and where we are now is an inflection point. Yeah, I mean, I do think it is an inflection point. I have been working in the telehealth space for a long time, um, along with May, and, um, and, and it really is a sea change, it's a shift in how people see it. Um, and it's not just, I think, the folks who've been working in telehealth policy, but Patients, I don't think are going to want to go back. Honestly, they have had you know over two years now of being able to get their healthcare um, using telehealth modalities. Um, they like it. Um, I don't think they really want to go back um, where they always have to go in for for any sort of care. And you know, I do want to stress that not every uh, you know service is appropriate for telehealth. There's many services where you do still have to go in person and that is gonna be the best quality of care, but there are a lot of things, including follow-ups and many of the services that Planned Parenthood also provides that can be very um, done very well um, and uh, effectively through the use of telehealth. And so, yeah, I, I really think that it is uh, sort of a, a shift in the way everybody sees it. And, I, and I've seen it with our providers as well, um, that even providers before who thought, you know, I have to have hands on my patient have now sort of been like, actually, I can provide some of this care very effectively through the use of telehealth. Um, I, I think, you know, going forward, just piggybacking on what Joe was saying is we have to really be careful because as we try to put up some sort of parameters around the use of telehealth, 
um, that those sort of um, like sort of borders don't have a disproportionate impact on those uh, patients who are at the margins. I think it's really important as we go forward to really center at the margins so that we're not leaving uh, the folks who have traditionally had a lot of barriers to healthcare left out again um, post pandemic. And I think that's, that's the thing that I think is really important to think about. Thank you for that, Lisa. Uh, Dr. Majid, in your opening remarks, you mentioned some of this in terms of those patients that either had challenges with access or around the margins. Let's talk about your engagement in this process and your thoughts on the inflection point. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think that number one, to follow up on what Joe said, that physicians have been practicing telemedicine ever since the phone was invented. And I think this is something that really ties into not only what we're, I think focusing on that now is really elevating the care, both in terms of documentation and the assessment to really understand the impact of a phone conversation. And from a pediatric standpoint, anyone who has a child knows that quite a bit of medical care is delivered by phone. I think also in terms of inflection points, I think that people really understand that when it comes to the concerns regarding fraud and abuse, I can say that I don't know that telemedicine is any worse than in-person care. And in some ways I've always at, said that when you perform a visit via telemedicine, you actually have tighter reins because people will know what the limitations of your capability are. So I have much less concern about that. And the, the last point in this part of the discussion is that physicians for years have had to determine what the best situation is for their patient. And, and I think not to say that physicians make a lot of mistakes, there's no question about that, but I don't think having the ability to use telehealth is gonna make that any worse by any stretch of the imagination, sort of the best place for the patient for the particular situation. Thank you very much. And Katie, um, uh, I know that ITUP is very engaged in this space, um, uh, especially with the, the folks that you, uh, represent that you are the voice for. Can you add to this discussion in terms of ITUP's engagement in the process now? Yeah, thanks, Peggy. Um, you know, I just want to echo uh, everyone's comments um, about how this and yours, this really is an inflection point time. Um, you know, we're hearing it not only in the policy discussion, right, where we're talking about paying for telehealth, not just for specialty care, but for all types of care for primary care and really making this available to the broader, in particular, the broader Medi-Cal population, um, which just really hasn't been done and hasn't been utilized. Um, so the money's there and I think the, the discussion is there and certainly because of COVID, we've had this catalyst, the need is there. Um, and folks have really overnight had to stand up telehealth programs and policies and procedures and processes at the, at the practice level, which they didn't have to do. Um, prior to this, it was more of a choice and during COVID it became a necessity. So I think we've just seen transformation at the practice level, um, at the policy level, at the dollars level. Um, you know, we're, we have Medi-Cal funding from CMS coming all the way through our state for this. And I also think from a consumer perspective, um, you know, and Lisa talked a lot about this, people want this. There are studies out that show that people now have devices that they didn't have 10 years ago or even five years ago. Um, that are capable of doing audio and video visits um, or emails to your provider. Um, I think people expect this now in a way that they didn't um, even a decade ago or even five years ago pre and, and really even pre-pandemic. So, um, you know, I think all of, the, all of the conditions are right for us to sort of create a baseline of telehealth availability and really think about how, you know, where, as Lisa said, we're really focused on We've all agreed that telehealth is really important. As Dr. Magic said, it, it can be transformative and doctors and patients are gonna find the right balance for how to use it. Um, and so I think our challenge now from both a policy and a state perspective and from a, a local delivery system perspective is how do we iterate on that? How do we create better access? How do we create better um, culturally competent care um, for the people who need it the most? And it's everyone, you know, as Lisa said from Medi-Cal patients and our most vulnerable patients. It's also, um, you know, and, and it's also, you know, parents of young children, et cetera. It's really a very exciting tool. Um, and so I think this is just, uh, you know, and we've all, I think in our process um, in these types of webinars, but also with the Department of Healthcare Services has said, this is just the beginning. 
this is the beginning. So let's set it up in a way that allows us to really make this available. And then we can look at quality. We can look at availability. We can look at access. We can look at um, you know, how best to deliver this. I'm really excited about some of the recent reports that are coming out where we're truly looking at the effectiveness of telehealth and how it fits into the broader, broader um, care that we provide to people. Thank you, Katie. And, um, you know, you, you raise for discussion here um, some of the delicate balance that needs to take place as we move forward. If, if this is the inflection point, even though many of us have been doing this for like 20 years, um, if this is the inflection point and we can move forward, one of the areas of discussion, controversy, delicacy is um, around um, the in-person, the new in-person and video requirements. Um, how would you, from your organizations, from your practice perspectives, say we need to move forward respecting um, both consumer concerns and organizational concerns. Katie, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think um, continuing to pay attention to this is really, really important. Studying the data um, and making sure we understand how people want to access healthcare and how are they accessing healthcare and do we have any patterns of misuse? I think that absolutely is an important thing to think about. Um, recognizing also that this is not the end all be all. Telehealth is extremely transformative. But it's not a one-to-one, -one, you know, an audio visit isn't, isn't going to meet the needs of someone who truly needs to be seen in person. And so how do we actually use this as sort of a yes and? Yes, we have an in-person system. And how can we use telehealth to get better outcomes and give people more access when they need it and potentially better serve them in the way that they need to be served? Um, I, I think that that's something that we're going to be listening to from everyone from, you know, federally qualified health centers to hospitals to um, consumer groups. Um, so I think that's important to keep checking in on this and making sure that we're working and also having good data from the Department of Healthcare Services perspective. I also think we truly, um, and several of you have probably heard me say this in multiple venues, we really do need a conversation about connectivity and what that means. I think there's been really important data collected that said, even though we all have, I'd say the vast majority of Californians have a cell phone, do you have data? Do you know how to use your cell phone? Do you have the ability to download an app? Do you know how to use that app in the right way um, until we get not only people fully connected, uh, whether that's Wi-Fi to fiber broadband, um, you know, and, and clearly uh, it's not only an issue in rural areas, but also a problem in urban areas as well, as we've, we've seen some data come out and show that we have to tackle this in both areas. Until we get that to a place where we truly can have high quality video visits, people have the, the connectivity, the right devices, and the understanding, the digital literacy on how to actually do that, I think we have to be careful on the policy side to, um, to overcorrect for video visits versus, um, versus audio visits. And, and just recognize that this is all very nuanced. What's perfect for a patient uh, you know, who has a child with a cold and just needs to talk to a doctor is very different from someone who might have higher, say, behavioral health needs and is just seeing a provider for the first time. So um, setting out that baseline process is really important, um, I think, from a policy perspective and allowing us to have the flexibility to collect the data, to iterate on it, and really understand what's best for patients and providers and what's going to get the best health outcomes is going to be really important. Katie, thank you for that very full answer. Um, you know, I it, it, really, it's, it's very important because I think there's a lot of popular discussion right now around health equity and disparities. Um, you know, I think it's important to say that, that, that those disparities extend to technology and connectivity. You can't have health equity if you can't be connected, if you don't understand how to be connected. Um, so that's an important discussion for us to have if we're really committed to equitable access. Uh, Dr. Majid, I'd like to hear from you on um, the requirements around in-person and video and, and what your um, um, organization and how you practice is, is impacted. 
Yeah, so, so I think it is important that regulation doesn't stunt innovation. And, and one particular concept, which was actually published by a couple of the faculty at UCSD is the so-called wasted first visit. So I think you have to view telehealth and in-person care as a continuum. And I think it's even more important for people who are under-resourced and have difficulty, whether it's missing work, having to get care for other children. So essentially the, the idea being even for a new patient, Oftentimes the initial history and encounter is primarily to get a history and to determine what diagnostic tests you do. So if you only have limited resources to be in person, it's very important that you get information up front. You can actually get some diagnostic testing done before you have that sort of critical in-person visit if that's going to be the case. So I think it, it, it really is important to sort of take telehealth as far as a you know, continuity of how effective it can be in terms of innovative delivery of care. And, and the other part, too, is the, the ability to access in through school. So I think that clearly the digital divide is paramount. People don't have connectivity. They don't have the data plans, as you said. So from a pediatric perspective is how can we utilize this in, in the schools? And this is something that's done to a fair degree in terms of social services and mental health. But this is also something that we're exploring that we're going to have we're going to have several years, even if the funding is there to improve broadband, there's gonna be several years before we can reach all the population as they should. So how do we utilize resources that are available now specifically in the schools to access children when they have access to technology and they can have virtual visits as well. Thank you for that. I want to um, kind of interrupt my questioning with a comment um, that I want to share in its completeness um, submitted by someone on, on the, the phone with us today. And if, if it's okay, if I can indulge the panelists, I like to just read it in full. Um, and thank you, Wendy, for submitting it. For those of us who have been actively doing telehealth for years, she says, me personally, since 2020, I've been pleasantly excited at the massive nationwide telehealth pilot project that is COVID-19. I like the way she puts that. The numbers have proven that what we've been saying for years. In our Indian health clinic, we have seen and documented hugely improved healthcare outcomes. People keep their appointments, no-show rates have plummeted, it meets people where they're at. A great response from patients and clinicians. It removes so many of the barriers to healthcare that underserved populations experience, including travel times and capabilities. We so hope that telehealth to the degree it's been used in the past two years is here to stay. Feel like the decision regarding whether a visit should be in-person or can be successfully managed remotely should be left up to the patient, family, and clinician. Lisa, would you like to comment on Wendy's statement? Sure, I mean, I think just sort of combining that statement with your original question, Peggy, um, you know, I think we really need to be careful at the policy level to put sort of arbitrary uh, policies that go across the board. I think both Katie and Dr. Magic just mentioned there are so many different sort of iterations. Every patient's circumstances are very different. Um, here in California, especially, uh, we have such a diversity in demographics of our population, as well as like just geographically. I mean, there are large swaths of the state where you actually have no connectivity whatsoever. Um, and those communities in the past have had real, you know, access issues, especially in the Medi-Cal space, um, where you do have to travel really far to see a specialist or, um, you know, just to be able to get basic health care. And, and that has really, you know, I think the, the use of not just video synchronous telehealth, but the ability to do audio or telephone visits has really changed that. And I think going to Wendy's comment, like, Many folks, like, they can't take a whole day off work and find childcare for their other children to, like, go to, you know, see a doctor. That might mean that they're off work and they don't get paid for that day. They might not have transportation. Um, and, you know, I think that 
being able to take care of some routine things using telehealth um, has been a real game changer. Um, and so I do caution against sort of these like blanket, like you have to have an in-person visit before you can have any other telehealth things. I mean, that is a huge barrier. I know for our folks at Planned Parenthood, many of our patients, you know, they're not here, they don't come to Planned Parenthood because they're interested in setting up our primary care, you know, relationship or they would be coming back. Um, many of the patients that come to Planned Parenthood are there for a specific reason. Uh, they may not actually have any sort of any interaction with the healthcare system at all outside of what they're coming to, to um, Planned Parenthood for. Um, and so uh, sort of blanket, like you have to have an in-person visit to establish or it has to be by video synchronous. Um, I think is a, it could potentially be a huge barrier for, for many of the patients and particularly the patients who've already had been facing sort of barriers to accessing healthcare in the first place. So you know, I think we just have to be real careful about sort of these sort of one size fit all policy solutions. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Marlene has asked a question that I'd like to answer live. Um, she is making a comment about a fuller discuss discussion around the question of in-person uh, sessions. Um, from a beha for, for behavioral health providers, they're required to meet with their clinicians at least once a year. She's asking, does anyone on the panel know how that needs it? to be documented? Does it need to be documented in any special way? I don't, I don't have the answer to that. I don't know, but I- May's, May's coming off mute too. Oh, so. Okay. <laughs> Uh, to, just a note before May gives us the mm -hmm. real answer. Uh, there's definitely, you know, we, Lisa just talked about sort of the nuances between the types of, um, the, the types of appointments where, you know, audio only versus in-person might be appropriate. And so I, there's been a lot of discussion about flexibility. And I know that a lot of the conversation in the DHCS um, work group has been around specifically um, the need for in-person visits to bring on, you know, to, to build a relationship with uh, people receiving behavioral health services. And, um, you know, as I, even I said before, there's a difference between, you know, an established provider or, or a provider and needing to talk to them about a child with a cold versus a behavioral health visit. So a lot of nuances here, but I'd love to hear May's real answer to this because I know she knows. So I believe the question is in relation to the CMS uh, mm -hmm. regulation. Yes policies regarding a mental and behavioral health visit. So um, just, a, just a reminder for our attendees, this is about the California proposal. So that was not something among the California proposals. We are talking about a federal CMS Medicare policy, not even Medicaid, Medicare policy. Um, keep in mind that those policies were done through an administrative process. Medicare has like agreed to put them in place, but there's a delay to them. In the federal budget bill that was passed for 2022, they said that those policies would be delayed for an additional 151 days after the public health emergency is declared over. So even if the public health emergency is declared over and you think our waivers go away, they're actually sticking around for, some of them are sticking around for an additional 151 days. And they also did that for these additional requirements that Medicare had put in place regarding audio only and mental and behavioral health visits. Now, as far as whether you need to document that, CMS has not come out with guidelines on exactly how you're supposed to be doing this. And there were also a couple other questions on terms that they use, such as, oh, it can take place near the home. Well, what does that mean? Like, you know, you're out on the sidewalk, you're like a mile away, what, whatever. So those are all questions that CMS will need to answer. But I'm thinking that they probably have not come out with those clarifications yet because they realize we're still in the public health emergency. Plus now with the congressional uh, uh, passage of the federal budget bill and the signing of it, they also have like another 151 days where those requirements will not kick in. So we're still kind of a wait and see and like what CMS will actually come out with as far as directions on documentation and what they mean with some of the terms that they used as well. Back to you, Peggy. Thank you, May, appreciate the answer. So Joe, I wanna to turn to you um, and specifically ask about how um, you are engaging your uh, stakeholders in this process. Um, 
since I'm one of them. Um, <laughs> I work for you then. <laughs> Good. So tell me what what um, what you all are doing as an organization to really keep the fire lit on the discussion around what what we need to do from all perspectives to create that equity for telehealth from um, your stakeholders. Uh, excellent question. You know, uh, ARP is a big organization. California is one of uh, uh, many uh, state offices uh, that represent our membership. So in California, we focus on advocacy. We're tracking different uh, legislations, proposals in the space, make sure that the voices of not only our members, but really intergenerationally gets a hearing when it comes to considering these uh, legislation ideas. So advocacy is big as far as ARP is concerned. Outreach and education is also big. The question that came up, which uh, only may can answer fully, you know, is part of the challenge here, right? It's so complicated that uh, you, you need a may to explain it to you. Uh, it should be simpler, especially for providers and fairly qualified health clinics who don't have the time to look at the policy book and, and interpret the policy. So outreach and education, ARP working with the California Telehealth Coalition and other like-minded organizations, we are out there in communicating you know, the uh, initiatives that relate to this uh, issue, as well as uh, providing updates to our members and our volunteers. So advocacy, outreach and education, and really um, having communication with the right people at the department to ensure that you know, the key principles, if you will, inclusion, equity, um, special attention to population with uh, social disparities are not forgotten in the discussion around policy because sometimes it gets lost uh, because the focus is on kind of the, uh, the mechanics of the policy. So we're weighing in on different levels and uh, you know, thanks to other organizations who collaborate with us. So we seem to be gaining ground. And lastly, I'd like to commend because it's hard work, the Department of Healthcare Services for uh, being serious in this and taking some, I think, uh, progressive steps to make telehealth a tool for better outcomes, better access. So uh, that should be said, I think, because it's a lot of work. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And um, given the, the affirmations I see from your fellow panelists, that, that is, you have stated very well exactly the perspective that all of us that represent a group of stakeholders are um, conveying in this process. Telehealth is the great equalizer, or can be if we don't put it too many restrictions on how we do that. Um, you, you know, I wanna emphasize over and over again, and from the CHA perspective, we have been very clear that those flexibilities were given when they were needed, and they proved to be exactly what we've been advocating for this in all these many years. And so, why, Katie said this earlier, why would we go back to, to another way of doing things when, when um, it had so many positive outcomes for the patients that we represent? We only have a few minutes left, so I wanna ask a question and then ask each of our panelists to respond to that question. So as we move forward, um, in this process, what additional suggestions would you have generally for addressing telehealth policy? You can talk about this from the state perspective, you could talk about it from the federal perspective or both, um, uh, representing not only those folks that you, you are coming to the table representing, but in general, what, what do we need to do um, to address this in the Medi-Cal space and especially from an equity perspective. Dr. Matchett, I'm gonna start with you. Yeah, I, I think metrics are really important. I, I think this is whether 
the state has a capability or the resources to really look at outcomes. But I think this is also something we should put on some of the commercial payers that we can e extrapolate some of that information because I think in lots of ways we're sort of guessing at where this is going. And I think it's, you know, we've had decades of trying to look at that in medical care in general. We're not very great at looking at metrics. So I think it, putting an emphasis on metrics or just not guessing at what should and should be paid for and to really assess whether or not we're meeting the needs of our entire society. Thank you. Great answer, Katie. Yeah, thanks. Um, I wholeheartedly agree with uh, Dr. Madgett's metrics. We absolutely need that going forward. Um, but I think, you know, you, you've heard this today a lot, and we heard this in the in the telehealth advisory work group too, too making sure that we allow room for innovation to happen um, and think of telehealth truly as a tool um, to help us on access, help us on quality, help us on language access, um, help us on data. Um, really thinking about it as a tool that can be applied to different um, forms of care and, and really get us to better health outcomes. I think I'm thinking more of it as a tool rather than a visit, if that makes sense. It's another opportunity for us to take this and move even more forward into the 21st century because I realize we're almost 25 years into the century. <laughs> um, but really, really, um, really think of this as an op as a catalyst and an opportunity to transform healthcare in a tool, a new tool in our toolbox. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Joe. Yeah, so telehealth is one of those things that uh, the future has already happened, right? It's not going to be <laughs> next year. It's already happening. So uh, I think there should be a recognition about that. And you can shape the future by, uh, you know, maybe incrementally and sometimes make huge steps in terms of implementation. So two things that I personally would like to 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 uh, to appeal to policymakers. One is integration. There's a lot of programs going on that are fragmented. That telehealth can be kind of the connection between these programs. Uh, CalAIM is an example, a terrific program, a lot of potential. Um, I don't know if telehealth is a big component when it comes to the implementation of CalAIM. So integration. And the second thing is um, put some along the lines of what Dr. Madgett said, put some metrics, mm -hmm. check progress. So it's not just uh, you know an open book either or an open check. You know, change, amend, uh, make some adjustments as we move along. And you can only do that by knowing what you're measuring, right? Uh, so having some accountability as part of the process. Thank, Thank you. you. And Lisa, I'll go to you to, to close us out. Yeah, I mean, I think just looking into the future, just kind of combining what everything my co-panelists just said. I mean, for me, I just really want to make sure that telehealth isn't really treated differently as like a different thing, that it is fully integrated into our the way we deliver healthcare in this country. Um, and agree like if there should be metrics, uh, you know, I think there's some things we can really work on in terms of access, you know, there is some language access challenges when it comes to telehealth and, and various other sort of things that really need to be worked out. Um, but I also really want to, I, I want us to really think about it in not just sort of a completely separate modality that's really different. I really want it to be integrated as just the way we provide healthcare, and then you know we can set policies and and uh, gather data in that way, um, so that we can really think just for the end user, which is really the patient. Um, you know what what is the best for the patient, um, and I think that's that's what I hope that we can get to a place in the future where we're not just parsing out uh, based on you know on the modality and thinking about it in a totally different way. Thank you, Lisa. Great bow on the conversation, appreciate that. I'm sure the audience um, is just as honored as I am to have had this uh, hour to talk with, with my esteemed panelists. Um, May, I will turn it back over to you. 
Thank you, Peggy. And also thank you to our panelists, Joe, Dr. Magic, Katie, and Lisa. This was a wonderful discussion here. Um, do note that we are early still in this process. So these are just proposals at the moment. So we will see what happens over the next couple of months. Once again, I wanna to thank today's sponsor for this webinar, AARP California, the California Healthcare Foundation, the Center for Connected Health Policy. Please note that you will be receiving an evaluation for this webinar. It really help us out if you fill that out and return it. It's very short, so it would only take you a couple of minutes at most. If you have questions regarding the coalition, please feel free to reach out to me or Amy, and you can also access the CCHP website for the coalition page as well. This is being recorded, and we will post up later this week the recording as well as the PowerPoint for this webinar. Once again, thank you to our wonderful moderator, Peggy, and our panelists. Thank you all for attending. Thank you to our sponsors. Everyone have a great day and stay safe.